Hey, this is about a, a trip that I took uh, a year ago uh, in March of 2013. And the way this trip started uh, was that my friend Don Hibbs from Maine uh, basically asked me, um, do I have one more big trip left in me? We had done a big trip back in 1988. And at that point, he was 31 and I was about 41. So if you do the math, and you had 25 years, you can see as I was approaching 66, I had to think a little bit uh, more about whether or not I could handle a trip like this. Because as you get older, it does get more difficult, obviously. Um, but we decided on doing this trip to Labrador. Uh, we were out for 10 days. We did about 200 miles. And we basically took it easy. Um, but as in any dog sledding trip, um, it takes an awful lot of preparation. and. Uh, I went up to Don's place up in Millinocket, Maine, uh, outside of Baxter State Park. And we spent several days getting equipment ready. Uh, I went out with the dogs once uh, just to try to uh, get a sense of what his dogs were like. We, put, we took all of his dogs. He is a very experienced musher who has uh, um, won the Labrador 400 race, uh, raced in the Yukon Quest in Alaska, uh, won the Can-Am 250 three times. Um, runs trips himself, takes people out, has an isolated set of hunting and fishing camps. So <clears throat> he had a lot of experience and um, we decided to use all of his dogs because they were young and I only had a, a few dogs that probably uh, do a trip like this. Most of my dogs are getting So we spent several days getting things ready and Don builds his own sleds. They're made with al aluminum runners and um, there's not much to them. Uh, what you see, the, the red bag, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's called a sled bag. And that's where you put all your gear in. Um, and when you're doing a dog sledding trip like this, because we're not like in a race like the Iditarod, where you've got checkpoints and things like that, where all kinds of people, we were basically had to be totally self-sufficient. So we had to take everything we needed for the dogs, which included 240 pounds of dog food, plus everything we needed for us, uh, as on a winter camping trip. And we, there's no stores you know, on the trail or anything, so you better have what you need with you. Uh, and so loading the truck became an issue because we had to fit everything in there. And we had an awful lot of stuff to get in there. Um, and a dog truck, for those, again, of you who maybe aren't, aren't familiar, basically is made up of a, a series of kennels, in this case, four kennels on each side. These dogs are all Alaskan Huskies range from around 40 to 60 pounds. So we doubled up, we could double up each one of these uh, with the exception, I think, of two kennels. Uh, and that way we could take uh, up to 16 dogs if we had to, we took 14. Basically two seven dog teams. And uh, this up here, this is extra straw because straw goes in the kennels for, uh, for bedding. On the way up to Labrador, it was quite a, a trip for me, Don had been up there several times in the winter and the summer, but it was my first time. And one of the things that you see is this tremendous amount of uh, um, resource extraction that goes on in Canada. The huge hydroelectric dams, uh, the iron ore coming out of Labrador. Uh, and I really got a sense of, you know, stuff comes from somewhere. And a lot of the stuff that we use that we don't see down here in terms of mines and factories and stuff, uh, a lot of that comes from Canada. And you really see some humongous uh, hydroelectric projects, power lines, and huge, huge mines. Uh, along the way, we would stop every so often to do what we call uh, a procedure called dropping your dogs. It doesn't mean you take them out of the dog truck and drop them on the ground. You put them on the ground. You tie them up around the truck. These bars come out. And you put a chain up there. You tie them on there. Just give them a chance to go to the bathroom. And we can feed them that way. And so this is something we have to do probably every, we would probably stop every four hours or so. And as you can see, when we got to Labrador City, they get a little bit of snow. Uh, we started at a place about an hour east of Labrador City, a place uh, near uh, Emerald Station. And um, it was a cold, windy morning when we got there. Um, we had a friend of Don's uh, in the blue there, a guy named Greg, who was going to drive the truck back and then come pick us up at the end. And um, you can just see we've got a whole bunch of stuff to try to fit in those sleds before we could get started. 
And one of the things you might notice right away is we use traditional snowshoes for a couple of reasons. Partly because we're both old fogies and we like them, but more than that is that when you get into an area where you might have to break trail ahead for the dogs on snowshoes and you get so much snow, and this happened on the trip we did 25 years ago, we had to break trail uh, one stretch that took us four days to go 20 miles um, because there was so much snow and we had to break trail for the dogs. You want to have uh, more flotation and you get on these so-called modern day snowshoes. The other problem with these, or I should say modern so-called snowshoes I like to call them, the other problem with the modern snowshoes is that if they break, if your bindings break or something happens, they're really difficult to repair out on the trail. Traditional snowshoes are really easy to fix or to make up a, an emergency binding or whatever. So that was one of the reasons why we, why we took them. And you can see um, here also this this black thing here is our tent that went on my sled. And we, of course, took a shovel, which is something you're always going to want in the wintertime. And the trail we went on, Labrador has about 1,500 kilometers of groomed snowmobile trails. And this trail ran, uh, is part of the trail that goes, those of you who may have canoed up there, goes from, the train goes from Bay Como on the Gulf of St. Lawrence all the way up to Shefferville, way up north. And this is that train. So the trail follows parallels part of the, uh, that, tra that tracks for part of the way. And you sometimes you're right next to it. Oftentimes you're in the woods and in the trees. And um, so that's what those tracks are doing there. And, and if we didn't have the groom trail, and it's not like the groomer comes through there every day, but if we didn't have the groom trail, we would not, we've been going, our progress would have been much, much slower. And we were basically taking it easy as it was. So normally you get off of that, away from the railroad tracks, and you get these wonderful little lakes that you go on and some weren't so little. And the going was really good. We were able to make really good time. But again, we weren't pushing the dogs. We'd rest every now and then. These were young dogs, and we didn't want to uh, put too much stress on them. And one of the things that happens on a dog sledding trip, you as a musher are like a player coach. So if you don't take care of yourself, then you're not going to be any good to the dogs. And so you not only have to be in some kind of good physical shape, but you have to eat and drink and take care of yourself that way. So we were not only um, taking care of the dogs in terms of their nutritional uh, requirements, but we were also taking care of, of ours as well. And that's really important because as a player coach, you're sometimes working right along with the dogs. You're pedaling. So if you're on a sled, you're actually helping push. Sometimes you're pushing up the hill. Sometimes you're getting off the sled. Don and I are both big guys. We get off the sled, jog up the hill maybe to lessen the weight, lessen the, the strain on the dogs. So w your condition and what you do is very important to the working of the dog team. And the whole concept of a dog team is teamwork. If one dog isn't pulling, you can usually tell right away. And then for if you've got seven dogs pulling, and our sleds with us on them probably weighed about 500 pounds a piece. Okay, so if one dog doesn't pull, instead of seven dogs pulling 500 pounds, you've got six dogs pulling 500 pounds. So it's it's it makes a difference. So the whole concept of teamwork is is paramount. And along this trail, you'd find every 20 or 30 miles or so these little cabins. They call them chalets. In the old days in Labrador, they might have called them tilts. But Labrador has some of their own language. And um, you can see on this one, some of the siding was ripped off. And probably what happened was somebody got there late one night, and uh, uh, instead of this, ripping the siding off was easy firewood as compared to going out and, and gathering some of the black spruce. The black spruce up there, the dead black spruce, make excellent firewood. We got a fire going really quickly. And in fact, that first night, I stripped down just to my long underpants. It was so hot in there. It was like a sauna. They're about, these cabins are about 10 by 12. They have a wood stove in there. They have a bench and maybe a table. And so it's enough room for uh, you know, several people if you had to put them in there. And that's what it looks like inside. There's Don taking a break. And you can see the, the stove is in the lower left-hand corner. And we're, we're doing two things. We're uh, heating up our own our own dinner, and we're also melting snow uh, so we could have water and we could have water to help, uh, help feed the dogs. The dogs, when you come into a campsite, are strung out on a picket line. This is a cable 
uh, and they are, they're, they're tied on little short chains called drop chains. And this is the way they get fed, this is where they'll poop and pee, and this is where they'll sleep. And if it was really cold out in some places we did, we might cut brush to put under them to give them a little bit of insulation that way. Um, these dogs are quite thin by, our, by most people's standards. You look at them and think that, oh my god, don't they get fed? But there are tremendous athletes, canine athletes, and I always say, well, people who look at, for instance, an Iditarod dog, and they say, my god, that dog is so thin, and I'll say, well, most great marathon runners don't look like me. So, the snowmobiles that we would run into, and we, we ran into some, but not that many, up in Labrador, they don't fool around. They all drag sleds, and on these sleds, loaded with gas. And they've all got snowshoes and an axe, and these are very high-tech snowmobiles, a lot of them, and, uh, but they don't screw around, and they go hundreds and hundreds of miles off into the wilderness. And we ran into one guy who told us about a thing that happened about a year ago, uh, where, a year before, where he had, um, was out with two other guys, and he'd gone through, uh, he'd gone through the ice. And the snowmobile was sitting on the bottom of the lake in 10 feet of water. And so they built a fire and dried him out. And he just casually says, this all happened at 40 below. And uh, they dried him out, and they managed to get the snowmobile out. You have to build a tripod and somehow hook onto it and get it out. And they spent 24 hours drying it out. It had three inches of ice in the gas tank. And they dried it out and started it up, and off they went. And Don and I looked at each other, you know, just to say, well, geez, if that had happened down in New England, they'd make a movie out of it, you know. So. The dogs are, are, are tremendous canine athletes, as I said, and they are basically bred to pull. They love to work, and if you don't work them, uh, it makes it more difficult to live with them uh, because they're very high energy, and they all have different personalities. Uh, and some of them uh, will be ready to go all the time and some not. And so the key to putting a dog team together is figuring out which dogs are going to run where. Not every dog can run up front as a lead dog. And, and really trying to, it's just like putting together a soccer team or a basketball team or whatever, except that you, the animals that you're working with don't talk to you in English. You know, they've got a whole different language. So dog sledding, at first, when, if, you don't, if you've never done it, or if you just you know, kind of follow the idea ride, you think, oh, wow, that looks so neat. It's a great activity. It's all about the dogs. It's all about your relationship with the dogs. And you learn that very quickly. And it isn't just a question of love and being with the dogs. It's just it, it kind of takes over your life to a certain extent. And it's, it's a tremendous amount of work involved. It's certainly it uh, can be quite expensive, although I always say there are worse addictions like horses. Uh, but uh, it's all about the dogs and your relationship with them. So how you treat them and how you relate to them is key to the success of your dog team. Uh, we experienced a variety of types of weather on this trip, which is sort of typical Labrador. This was the end of March that we went. But uh, the coldest it was was 28 below, whereas the warmest was about 28 above. So that's a pretty big range. Now, one thing that happens on a, on a, any, any, with, with sled dogs is that their ability to withstand the cold is pretty good. But the heat, not so good when they're working because they don't have the method. They can't strip off layers like we can. They don't sweat like we do. Their, their mechanism of controlling body heat is different. So what you need to do is be careful when it's hot and sunny out and you realize that they're wearing the same coat at 28 below as they are at 28 above. So you take that into consideration. Now, as I said earlier, in Labrador, they, they talk thing about things a little bit differently. It's not always the way it seems. So what you have here is a sign saying caution slob, and I got Don and his lead dog Sylvia to pose for me. But in Labrador, slob means slush. So it means that this means that up at, this is a place called Boot Lake, and it means that up ahead you're going to encounter some slush on the trail. Uh, these are wolf tracks, tracks of a young wolf. There are certainly a lot of wolves in that area. We didn't see any. Um, and perhaps one reason was that the caribou herd 
this particular herd that normally would inhabit this part of Western Labrador was, had been about 750,000 head. And in the last couple of years, it had crashed. So that when we were up there, the herd numbers were down below 50,000, 50, they estimated that. So they had banned caribou hunting for the first time in a long time. There used to be caribou come right down into Labrador City. Labrador City is a town of about 8,000. The only reason it's there is because of the huge iron ore mine that's there. The, the mine looks about the size of Vermont to me. So uh, without the caribou, we didn't see any, we didn't see any wolves, but uh, there certainly um, there were around. And you know, the one nice thing about being on a trail when the weather is good is that you just get this feeling, boy, it's, just, it's, it's very hard to describe. It's like you got a good trail, the dogs are going good, the weather's good, and it's this, uh, um, it's just this tremendous amount of uh, uh, joy and, and ecstasy that you feel driving a dog team on conditions like that. When we got to a place uh, outside of Esker, we had heard about this Frenchman who had, was up there. He's from France, not French Canadian. And he was training for a polar expedition. And he had spent 20 days on Menahek Lake, which was a big lake that we were going to cross, uh, pulling these sleds and training for this polar expedition. He had done a traverse of the, of the Himalaya. And so he was interesting. He invited us in for tea. And uh, we got to see his, his sleds and stuff. So we get to this junction where you go to um, left to go to Esker and right to go to Churchill Falls, uh, which is a big town in central Labrador. And um, uh, Esker is basically just a railroad crossing for the most part. Uh, and that's where we picked up Menahek Lake. And once we got out on Menahek Lake and headed toward the Menahek Hills, then we're in an area where we were really in the bush. We were no longer uh, had any chalets or anything, not on the main snowmobile trail. Any snowmobile trail that we might follow now would be pretty much those uh, formed by trappers. Uh, and you can see this is typical Labrador weather. You know, in Vermont, for the most part, for instance, if it's cloudy, the sun comes out, then usually the sun is out. But Labrador, the sun can come out, and then two minutes later, it's like this again, and then it's snowing, and then it's, uh, it, it just changes very, very rapidly. And the Menahek Hills is this really um, beautiful part of western Labrador that we were heading for. And this is a lake about 60 miles long and several miles wide. And we did encounter some slush on the lake. And what happens when you get slush is that, you know, it's not like the, you're going to go through the ice, but you've got a lot of slush and it's just, the dolls will just basically, we, we just plow right through it. You, do, you can get wet, certainly, but the dolls just plow right through it. Um, and at various points, we had to cross little heights of land, uh, which was, became a little bit of a problem because some points here, we uh, had to put snowshoes on uh, to give the dogs track to follow. Uh, but we got up in the bush and at one point got off into the woods. And this was a place where we were going to set the tent up. And what we did was um, strung the dogs out. And then we had seen Don had done a lot of trapping over the years. So he was pointing out marten traps to me in the trees. And sure enough, we heard a snow machine after a while. And the uh, trapper came up. And um, uh, he was wondering, well, who made these strange looking tracks? Because they weren't snow machine tracks. And so he didn't know what it was. And uh, he had a really nice marten with him. And um, Don was amazed at how, how the rich color of the marten uh, how rich it was compared to the, the Martin that he used to trap back in Maine or even Alaska. So this was a tent we had set up. And believe it or not, it doesn't look like much. But uh, this is the stove that we use to heat the tent. Uh, there are different types of tent situations that you, you can use to sleep. What they say, they basically refer to as sleeping warm versus sleeping cold. Sleeping cold is what I did for years and years and years when I used to go out um, uh, winter mountaineering and snowshoeing and whatever on these trips where I, you know, I'd just get in the tent in my sleeping bag, didn't have any stove. But you can get a, sto get a tent where you have to carry a stove pipe with you and you have a little stove and you can stay much warmer that way and dry things out. Now one of the interesting things was here was that I decided to, uh, uh, I said to Don, I said, you know what, I'm going to dig out a hole and we'll set the tent up, you know, instead of, because there was so much snow just stomping it down. Uh, with snowshoes, which what you often do uh, to make it uh, a hard place to put the tent down wasn't going to work. So I started digging, and I started digging, 
And I started digging, and oh my God, after about 20 minutes, I just gave up because there was so much snow, it was ridiculous. And when I stuck my ski pole in, you know, about that much, uh, the pole stuck out. So there was obviously plenty of snow there. So what we did instead was we just, you know, cut brush and set everything up on that. And Don had a pretty simple way of getting heating water for the dogs. Basically, he took an old can that he'd used when he was, uh, um, um, polyurethane uh, the camps back in Maine and uh, uh, he punched some holes in it and his cook pot would fit right in there. In this case he's putting um, the, the, uh, the pot on top of the, of the logs there but this was a really quick way to get a fire going. So on the trail, if we were going to be heating water, melting snow for water for the dogs, we'd get a fire going in instantly uh, with this black spruce and uh, we'd be able to melt the snow really quickly. There you see the forlorn looking dogs. So we started in um, from Manahek Lake and went up to uh, along the Clark River, up to Clark Lake and through a couple other little areas. And you'd find these rivers with open water in the middle and we would stay on the sides. We didn't get obviously get near the open water. Uh, and this was the point, I think, in, when I really fully realized I was really in Labrador. And this was different than being in Maine or, or even parts of Quebec that we'd been in. Because you really sort of felt like you were out in a wild area. Uh, the trapper had told us about some camps on a lake called Cog Hill Lake. And um, he said, uh, you know, one of them is habitable. The others have been broken into by bears and were full of snow. So we were heading that way. So we went over that way. And we got to these camps. It was a beautiful spot. Um, somebody had built these camps years ago, thinking they would fly in fishermen in there. Uh, the problem with that is, is the summer, the fishing is great, but the bugs are unbelievable. So uh, that didn't work out. But it was a beautiful, beautiful spot. And uh, for us, it was like, uh, this was probably midway in the trip. We decided to take a day layover here. And for us, this was like a castle because not only would it have more, more room than, the, than those little 10 by 12 uh, cabins, but it had gas lights and it had uh, bunk beds. And so, you know, it felt like uh, we were in uh, a castle compared to the other places. And this is what these, some of the, the, the big hill outside, which we dubbed Mount Hibbs after Don, and uh, the, that I decided to climb up on the, on the day off that we took, gave the dogs a break. And I went up there, and you can see the view of the, uh, from down there. But you know, while I was up there, I was starting to realize a couple of things. <clears throat> when I was 36, I wouldn't have given any thought. 46, wouldn't have given any thought. 56, maybe a little bit of thought. Approaching 66, I started thinking about, well, my wife and the dogs at home. And I started thinking about, you know, if... I twist my knee or something, and Don's got to come up and find me and get me out, you know. I mean, I'm 6'2 and 2.30, and, you know, it's not going to be good. So, you know, you, you start looking at the world a little bit differently as you get older and you, you try to stay active. So you, I, I was definitely a little bit more um, uh, careful than I would have been when I was younger. So... I wanted to make sure I got home. There, I'm happy that I made it back. Uh, this is Don fixing, um, working on his bindings. Um, one of the things about snowshoes that I want to mention is that we would have really liked to have had a really small, simple pair of snowshoes that we could get in and out of easily. Ones that we, not even get in and out of easily, ones that we wouldn't necessarily have to take off. On our trip 25 years before, back in 88, up in northern Quebec, uh, where we were breaking trail for the dogs, every now and then we could feel underneath our feet a hard-packed snowmobile trail that we would, we would catch up, we would catch um, infrequently. And so what I would do is uh, I would actually ride on my sled, on the back of the sled, with my feet like this, uh, wearing my snowshoes, okay? But this is kind of a pain in the neck with long snowshoes. So there were times there where we really would have liked to have really little tiny little snowshoes that we wouldn't have had to take off. Where we, then when we had to get off, we wouldn't have to take the time to put them on, take them off, and things like that. 
and he's actually got a, a, a pretty simple type of snowshoe binding here, a piece of plastic with a couple of straps. It's an uh, easy thing to get in and out of. Um, the morning that we were going to leave from Cog Hill Lake, um, it had snowed overnight, it had blown quite a bit, and of course the dogs just, you go out in the morning and, and you can hardly see the dogs are covered with snow, which is kind of a neat thing about sled dogs. Um, at this point of the trip, you know, five days in, we had to make a decision. We had, uh, we started with 240 pounds of dog food. We didn't really want to run out of dog food if we could help it. And so we originally were going to make a big loop and go over to our McFadden Lake and we were going to follow what we, we were pretty sure there'd be a trapper's trail down through that. But the problem was, was that the weather had changed and it was now up in the upper 20s, the snow was softening, and so we decided that um, to try to do that loop, we ran the risk of, number one, uh, taking a lot longer than we would have planned for originally, and we probably would have run out of dog food. And two, it would have been much, much more difficult because we would have had to spend a lot of time on snowshoes. The trip that we had done 25 years ago, where we each had six dog teams, and both Don's team and my team um, back then were really more like what you might call traditional trapping teams. In other words, they would follow us on snowshoes or we broke trail ahead of them. These guys, all of Don's dogs, this trip, they would have just run up our backs. They weren't that, they were more of a racing type of dog. So uh, we didn't have that option to just go ahead and break trail with the dogs following us. It wouldn't have worked so good. <laughs> Don found I love this picture because he looks like he's, he's from Scott's last expedition or something. Um, this is actually a, a, an emergency snowshoe that somebody built. Uh, although when I show this picture to kids, they think it's a snowboard. So it probably could be used for that. So, you know, when you're in a pickle, you do what you, you have to to, uh, to make do. You know, like, I don't know what I'm doing, I guess. Okay, so we decided we were going to go back the way we came. This was a little bit disappointing, but we really felt it was the best choice under the circumstances. And of course, this is typical Labrador weather. Uh, and one of the things when you're running dog, two dog teams like this, you want to try to keep sight of the other guy, but you don't want to be running right up. I mean, we had stopped. That was probably why we were so close here. But if you run too close to the other dog team, if something happens to them, if they should run into problems where you know, uh, they start going through the ice or something like that, you don't want to run, you don't want to commit the same error. So you want to keep a certain distance apart, yet try to stay within sight if you could. Now one thing I should say, on this trip we took maps and compass, we didn't take any GPS. Basically because Don's GPS is broken, so we just didn't bother. We did have a satellite phone, so we could communicate with our wives and in case of emergency. But, um, so in some ways, it was, it was kind of nice not to have the GPS because it was, you know, we were sort of doing it old school, which, was, which we felt okay about. Um, and here you can see we've uh, uh, taken, a, taken a break alongside one of the rivers and um, heating some water up. Now, when we got to the Clark River, uh, we had a problem. And Sylvia, Don's lead dog, is a great lead dog but she swung us over into an area that was a little dicey. And Don went through, and then I followed, and all of a sudden the front end of my sled went like this, and it was stuck. And when I went up to try to pull that out, I went up through the ice uh, to water up to my hip. And so I got one leg in the water like this. Now I knew I didn't want to get the other leg in there, I didn't want to have both legs in there. Because when you look down and you see moving water, uh, that's not too good. So uh, I pulled that leg out, and then I tried to maneuver the sled, and then the other leg went in. So now both legs were wet, but I still didn't want to get both legs in there. So fortunately, Don wasn't too far ahead, and I was able to yell to him. So what he did was he set his snow hook, which is the anchor, that allows you to get off the sled and, and do whatever you have to do. Dumped his sled over, which is also a way of preventing the dogs from going ahead, and uh, came back to help. And typical Don fashion, he said, we got to get out of here, which of course I knew. But you know, uh, there's nothing like standing there looking at 
running water underneath you to put you in the here and now. Okay, and it's very different. You know, it's like you're always on a dog team. You're always thinking ahead because you're looking ahead. You're wondering about this, you're wondering about this. You're thinking about this. But all of a sudden, this happens, and everything just kind of stops, and everything slows down, and you're in that situation. You, you still have to do what you have to do, but it, it's a different sort of mindset. So we managed to get the sled up, the front end up, out, and the dogs got going. Don got out of the way. I hopped on the sled, and we managed to get out of it and get off the Clark River and over to Clark Lake. In retrospect, Sylvia had taken us over this one spot, which, was, which like I say, was a little dicey. And, and, um, um, but we managed to get out of it. And Don said, oh, don't worry. I'll call Nettie and tell her that you, know, you went through the ice and you're not coming back. But <laughs> so. so along these rivers, what would happen is as things would soften up Sometimes we wouldn't have, we'd lose the trail. We had some, had some snow, things had softened up. So what we had to do was, Don would put on his snowshoes, and he would go ahead and break trail, make a trail for the dogs, basically. And what, what we did then was we ran a line from the brake bar, which is the bar that you push down on to engage the brake on the sled, from, from his brake bar to behind my lead dog. So now I was driving a team, you can see the distance. You know, 14 dog team isn't that big a team, except now you've got the sled plus the distance of the line and everything in there. So it was quite a ways away, which wasn't too bad when we were just going along the rivers. But once we got up into the, off the, that, the river banks and up into the trees, it made for a little bit more difficult situation because we did have to go over this one height of land to get back over to the Menahek Lake area. And going around these trees was, was kind of difficult. And at one point, you know, what happens is in a situation like this, you want to get all the dogs pulling together because now you've got to break two sleds. And so at one point, I would, um, you know, I put my foot down, one foot on the sled runner, and the other foot on the ground to push off of. And of course, I immediately went up to my hip again in snow and the dogs at that point lunged forward, and they went like this, so I could literally feel and hear my groin being pulled. And uh, I'd already aggravated my, uh, my right Achilles, so that made things a little bit more difficult. But um, again, you know, these are the kind of things you have to deal with and learn how to, how to overcome them and, and uh, they do the best you can. The dogs are great. The one thing, even after I pulled my groin and, and aggravated my Achilles, um, which made pedaling with either foot really difficult, was that even going up the hills, um, they were able to do a really good job even without me helping very much. So we got back to the, uh, uh, we decided to keep going after I had gotten out of, uh, after we got off, off the Clark River and I was wet up to here and through my mucklocks and everything, we decided to keep going because it wasn't that cold. If it had been cold, we would have stopped right away, built a fire, and dried me out. So I said, you know what? I think I'll be all right. We'll make it to, the, we'll go back to the cabin by Esker. And so that's what we did. But by that point, uh, my feet were getting cold because my the mucklucks were wet and everything. So uh, it was good to get in there and dry everything out. And Sylvia, Don's lead dog, had been in heat the whole trip. So uh, he babied her anyway, but she got to come in that night. Uh, but when we left there, the weather cleared, and we had really beautiful going. And, um, you know, again, the only thing in my mind that was too bad was that we were going back the same way. It would have been nice to be able to make that loop and see some new country. The dogs, you know, when you're driving another person's dogs, it's different because it takes you a while to get used to them. Uh, it took me a while to get used to the, how the sled handled because the sled handled differently than my sleds. Now, Holly, who was my main lead dog, um, she was great, but she would be a terror around other females. So we had to make sure that she stayed away from the other females on the trip. Uh, they all had different personalities, and again, learning these personalities um, is important to how, um, how well the dog team works effectively. Uh, one of the most interesting and I thought beautiful areas that we went through was an area, a burned out area that had a forest fire. Uh, and these trees, you know, at first you look at them and you say, Wow, look at how those trees are growing. Then you realize, oh, wait a minute, there's been a fire there. Because it was really kind of neat. 
Um, if you're wondering why there's so many pictures of these snowshoes, it's because Marie uh, Bhutan and her husband, who makes these snowshoes over in uh, Williamstown, um, made these for me for this trip. So that's why I got a lot of our snowshoes in there. But um, uh, again, we had a beautiful night that night, full moon, almost a full moon. And these are just some of the pictures of some of the dogs. That's Milo. I think that's Skunk. Grizz. Now Tova, this is Tova, she was a, a little female, probably weighed less than 40 pounds. And what was interesting about her was at one point on the trip, she stopped eating. So uh, it was when we were at Cog Hill Lake at those camps that, had, that were, uh, had the lights and the bunk beds and stuff. So she got to eat for about a day or so. Uh, she was fed uh, peanut butter and honey sandwiches and sardines. And, um, and then she started eating again after that. Don took my sunglasses there. So <clears throat> we started heading back. We're heading back now, and um, we didn't have any problems. You know, and one way to look at this, I can say, well, we didn't see any wolves. We didn't hear any wolves. We didn't see any northern lights. We didn't see any caribou. So in that sense, you could say, well, it was sort of disappointing. But, um, you know, on the other hand, um, when things don't, when things generally go well, when you don't have too many problems on a trip, I don't want to say that it's boring because it wasn't boring. It's just that you always expect something wrong to happen. You always expect something around the bend to happen, and so you need to be prepared for it. And we were pretty lucky that we didn't, you know, we didn't have anything bad happen to us. Um, these are railroad ties uh, along the tracks um, that they stored there. And one of the things about Labrador that's interesting is that you may think that, well, you know, you're really far away and it's out in the boondocks and everything. They had, you know, I wish I had the, uh, uh, the pickup uh, truck dealership up there in Labrador City. And they were as connected as anybody down here. And they had everything up there because the only way to get people to stay up there and work in the mines is to have everything up there. And so when we got back, we actually ate at this restaurant that um, it was like a Hawaiian-themed restaurant, and everybody that worked there was Filipinos. So, well, finally we got back to Emerald Station, and um, uh, uh, the dogs did great. And um, we, as we got ready to load them up, you know, one of the things that that we were bound to determine uh, on this trip was that we were going to stay friends, because very often two people on a trip like this, you can easily get into hot water with each other. But we have stayed friends, and. And one of the other things that happened was everybody we'd run into, we'd ask, which one of us looks older? Which one do you think is older? And most people thought that Don was older, so he would give me all kinds of grief about that. So, um, but uh, it was a good trip, and it was a great learning experience. Uh, and of course, the question now is, do I have another big trip left in me? We're planning on one 25 years hence. You know, I'll be 91, so. Okay, um, can we get some lights, Chris? Thank you. Um, two things, one before I answer any questions. Uh, I've got some my mitts and my mucklucks and my wind parker that I brought with me on the, that I use on the trail that I was on the trip over there if anybody's interested. Um, and then, um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some questions and then I'm going to bring in, I brought two dogs with me. Uh, those that you want to meet them, uh, I'll bring them in and God knows what will happen when I bring them in, but we'll see. So, uh, any questions? Michael. I've got so many, I don't know where to start, but the last, the last one, that, when you said that one of, one, of, one of the females was in heat the entire trip, I just said, no, no, it can't be. You, how could you take a dog in heat out? knowing she was... Well, it happens all the time. I mean, how can you take... A, the question is, how do you take a dog in heat with you on a trip? It happens on the Iditarod and whatever. Now, a lot of people, particularly if you were going on a, 
Uh, for instance, when um, uh, if you're going on a really long polar expedition, okay, or, or you know something where you're going to be out for several months, okay, on a trip like that, you might not want to bring any females because you don't want to have anybody come in the heat because that can be you know a little bit different. But on a trip like this, you know the dogs are used to each other. Yes, had they been able to get to Sylvia, you could have had a breeding, but we made sure that you know, that wasn't going to happen. So when we came into camp, the first thing we did was we separated Sylvia and tied her off someplace else. But yes, it, it, it can be an issue, but it, it wasn't, fortunately. Hmm? How was the, the dog, the, because the dog was in heat, did you have trouble sleeping with how your... No, uh, the question was, be, uh, if I, I'm repeating the question because Chris wants to make sure it gets on the... Uh, on the um, on the video, uh, the question is 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 what about howling and with the dog in heat? Actually, there was no howling. You know, you could tell they were interested, but they weren't crazy interested. So why? I don't know. Uh, that's an, that's a good question. I forgot to mention that is that um, Don had put. Uh, the bo these sleds are called toboggan sleds, and they have a big piece of plastic in the middle. And my sled had plastic that <clears throat> apparently he got from somebody that he, he wasn't, it, it wasn't as good as normally it should have been. Something was, there's a lot of different types of plastic that they make. And so what happened was on one particular part of the trip especially, I was actually plowing snow. In other words, snow was picking up and, and sticking underneath. And it made for, of course, a very, very heavy sled and much more difficult going for the dogs. So I'd have to stop, dump the sled over on its side, kick, or sometimes use my snow hook even to knock that snow out. And that was a, that was a pain in the neck. But normally, if you've got decent plastic, that shouldn't happen too often. Well, sometimes it can, and sometimes it can happen on the runners. But, um, uh, and if you do, you just have to stop and scrape it off, and there's not much you can do about it. Well, the tip, what was the typical day was and how long, how much light we had? We had, you know, quite a bit of light. I and mean, it's like, uh, you know, it's like here, I think, and, and, and I don't know the, um, technically how much more or less or whatever. But um, we would get up fairly early, uh, but uh, we, you know, it just takes time to get going because you have to melt, melt, gather snow, melt snow, you know, get the fire going, all that kind of stuff. So we weren't in any rush. And we knew we weren't going to be putting a huge amount of miles on each day. So I would say we probably, I don't know, I'm just going to, I can't remember. I would say we probably got going 9, 30, 10 o'clock or so every morning. You know, we just, it wasn't a, we weren't in any big rush. So the only, the only thing we had to do was make the last day, we didn't have that far to go, to get back to Emerald Station by noon. That was the only really deadline we had. So... Labrador, an enormous island? How La you get onto okay, La Labrador is part of the confederation with Newfoundland. So the province is actually Newfoundland and Labrador. But Labrador is part of the mainland. And it's, it's bordered on the west by Quebec and on the east by the Labrador Sea and on the north by Ungava Bay. And what we did was we drove up through a small part of New Brunswick and Quebec mostly in Quebec, and you drive up and, you know, I don't know, it's like a thousand miles or something. And, uh, but you have to cross, we cross the Gulf of St. Lawrence in a ferry, which is about a two and a quarter hour ferry ride. And that was the other thing. A lot of times on that ride, you'll see whales, because you're on, you know, you're in the ocean basically there. And so I didn't see any whales. No whales, no wolves, no caribou. So. You talk about the relationship between the you and the dogs being really important. Um, how did that all work out with using somebody else's dog? It worked out pretty well. I think partly because, you know, I've had a, you know almost 40 years' experience working with dogs, and I knew enough. Number one, to um, basically try to do what Don was doing, 
in terms of how he was talking to him, how he was running him. And I also knew enough that if there was something, you know, if I had a question, what I would ask him, in other words, uh, I could have done that. I could have taken his dogs and run them without him, but um, I tried to do it in the way that he did it. In other words, tone of voice and things like that. Um, one of the interesting things, the dogs that you're going to meet that I brought with me, Boomer and Scuppy, uh, when my wife Annette and I did a trip up to Maine uh, three years ago, uh, we took eight dogs, came back with ten, because Don had and his wife had gotten Boomer and Scuppy from somebody, and they were basically just keeping them until they could find somebody who would take them. And so we met them that night. We got up there. The next morning, we put them in our truck, drove out to where we started the trip, put them in the team, and off we went. So dogs are very adaptable about that sense, much more so than people. Imagine if you're at you know, your work situation, and all of a sudden somebody throws two new people in there and says, go out and do this amazing thing or whatever. You know, it's, you know, it doesn't happen. Dogs are much more flexible and adaptable than, than oftentimes we give them credit for. And um, so, I, but the, the point you're asking is, is a good one because I think that what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to do something that would upset the way Don had been training them. Everybody trains differently, but I, I went tried to go along with how he did things. You, there appeared to be a couple of, of uh, pure Siberian Huskies in there, but most of the other dogs looked like just basic Texas. The Alaskan Husky is a crossbreed. They're not a purebred dog. And if you go way back in time, although people can, can now, they can cite different lines that have been established over the years. But if you go back in time, in, in Alaska, for instance, there were dogs, what they would call village dogs. These are dogs that would just grow. They didn't necessarily, they weren't purebred. There were only three purebred sledding breeds, the Alaskan Malamute, the Siberian Husky, and the Samoyed. And so what you had was they might have bred these dogs with some Siberians. And then over the years, they, now they breed them with hounds and everything else. So in fact, all these dogs were Alaskans, there weren't any Siberians. Some looked Siberian-like. Um, and what you have is a dog with hybrid vigor and all those kind of benefits. Um, with what? With, you say dogs with what? With hybrid vigor. Hybrid vigor. Yeah, in other words, that... that Tougher than usual. Yeah, yeah. And so you get, for instance, uh, the Siberian Husky. Um, and I've had everything. I started with Malamutes, and I've had Siberians and Alaskans and Sammies and everything over the years. The Siberian is a great dog when the conditions are really tough. But they're just not as fast in a racing mode as an Alaskan Husky. So that's why most people use Alaskans. There are some people that still use Siberians. But under certain circumstances, I'd rather have a Siberian. Because under certain circumstances, for what they were bred for originally, they'd actually be better than an Alaskan. And if you follow the Iditarod, which of course is going to start in 10 days, what you're going to see is dogs wearing booties, dogs wearing coats, dogs wearing wrist Litz, and this is not, you know, what sled dogs were originally bred to do. So it's kind of like having these high-powered racing dogs are like the equivalent of a high-powered racing car. You know, they're very, they can go tremendously, but the little something little thing runs wrong, and you got to, you know, then you've got problems. So. Um, uh, if I throw in a follow-up on that, I would have. Been I would have ima had imagined that in minus 30, minus 40 temps, that you would have had to have dogs with a fair amount of undercoat. Well, they do have an undercoat. Oftentimes, if you look at them, they don't look like they do until they start shedding in the spring and summer. Uh, there are some dogs that are, it, the outer coat, which are the guard hairs, that does not have to be exceedingly long. In fact, if it's too long, it's going to collect snow and ice, and it can be a problem. So what they do is they grow that soft, oily underfur, and the combination gives them tremendous insulation from the cold. Now, we have some dogs at home, for instance, that are 12, 13, 14, when the wind is blowing right and we've had some really cold weather, we go out and put, put coats on them just because they're a little bit old and they've got some arthritis or whatever. So, yeah, there's sometimes you're going to need them and sometimes you're not. Um, with these guys that we brought, for instance, 
uh, even at 28 below, uh, we felt that they were fine because they were young enough to be able to withstand it. So. Do the dogs have a place on the team? That is, are they in the same position, or can you mix them up? And uh, now you, can, you should be able to mix them up. Now, not every dog is going to be a lead dog because the, the whole question of where they are in a team depends on their um, ability to perform that function. So for instance, the lead dog's job is critical because, and usually you're running two dogs up front, or in this case we ran one mostly, but um, because you've, you, they want to be able to take the commands, it's all by voice commands, there's no reins. Uh, you want to be able to have a good trail sense and uh, provide some enthusiasm, keep the lines tight, et cetera. Well, not every dog wants to be up front because when you turn around and look, you say, whoa, this is a big responsibility. There's all these other dogs behind you. So you got to get the right dogs in the right position. Now, sometimes you'll have dogs that will run better on the right than on the left. Sometimes they'll run better, you know, one dog will run better next to another type of dog, that kind of thing. But it, you just, that, that you find out through trial and error and experimentation. But ideally, you have as many dogs as you can can run all different places in a team. And um, uh, sometimes what you'll have is, and I've had this over the years, you'll have the brains and the brawn up front. In other words, one dog, uh, one of the lead dogs is the brains of the outfit. The other is the one that provides all the, so for instance, I've had dogs where, you know, we're going down the trail and, and then all of a sudden a rabbit crosses the trail or, so, or a chipmunk or something and, you know, that one dog tries to pull the team over that way and the other dog yanks them back. So, you know, that you, you try to find that balance. And a good lead dog can literally, literally save your life, no question about it, if the circumstances are, are such. You, have a, you mentioned having a dog that didn't want to pull. What kinds of things can you do to get that dog to decide not to pull again? Well, what do you do if a dog doesn't want to pull? Well, some days, they have bad days just like we have bad days. So there are some days they're kind of flaky or whatever, and other days not. Now, we have a dog at home. When you look at him, he looks like he should be the greatest sled dog because of the way he's built. But early on he pulled, but in the last several years, he'll go out on a run with us, he'll go out on a trip with us, but he won't pull. So, you know, what do you do? There's not much you can do at that point. Uh, now, we have our queens are actually the one dog we have who actually has completed the Iditarod. And she's 12, not, not, not I didn't run her in the Iditarod, but, but, um, but she's 12 years old now. And this year, we also had to do an operation on her to remove a uh, mammary tumor uh, in December. Well, she's been running all winter, but she's decided that, no, yeah, I'll run, but I'm not really going to pull. She's, you know, she's basically decided she's had it. But I take her out partly because just to keep her in shape and partly because I can, I can use her ability as a lead dog sometimes to make crucial turns when I really would need her. But basically, if I'm running six dogs with queens, I know that only five of them are really pulling. So, and you know, with someone my size, it makes a difference. Well, you know what happens is when you don't pull your weight, uh, the question is, is this, do the dogs put up with other dogs when they're not pulling their weight? It's more often when you're not pulling your weight. So if you're going up a steep hill, or you're going up through a lot of deep snow, or it's a really warm day, all things which are going to be more difficult for the dog, make it more difficult for the dogs, a lot of times they'll look back as if to say, hey, start pedaling or pushing or something, you know? And so, um, but they will, the easiest way to train a young and experienced dog is to put them next to an experienced dog because they'll pick it up quicker. But the, they will, there are some times where dogs will uh, kind of snap at another dog as if to say, hey, get going. You know, they can't pick it up, some of them. So the whole question of communication is one that I find fascinating. And I, I, over the years, I've tried to read a lot of these books that talk about dog communication and all this stuff, and I've totally never finished any of them. And I think partly because the one thing about having dogs which fascinates me no end, which I really love, is the mystery 
of the stuff that goes on in their heads that I have no idea what it is. You can predict that how a dog will do in certain circumstances, but do you really know what's going on in their head? They are living, first of all, like all animals, they are living totally in the, in the here and now. Totally, all the time. And so, you know, I look at a dog and I say, you know, this is interspecies communication. So how do I really know what's going on? I don't, you know? And so part of me actually does not want to read these books and find out what some PhD has to say because I enjoy the fact that I don't know. It's like a mystery. And that's part of the attraction for me. So that every time I go out, okay, so like my wife Nettie will say, well, how was your run? And I'll say, oh, such and such happened, you know, and, and well, why did that happen? Well, I don't know. You know, half the time I don't know. And to me, it's an, that's a, one of the most attractive things about having dogs is because it's something that I don't know and we probably will never really know, and that's fine. There are some things that you just should not know. Well, how much of the day? That's a really good, how much of the day do I spend with the dogs? Quite a lot. Um, because I'm technically one of my semi-retired, I guess, sort of. So I spend quite a lot of time with them. The dogs at home, like here's where here's the front door of the house, and I'd say where you are, that's how far away our closest dog is in terms of, of the kennel. So they're always there, they're always part of our life. We always have dogs in the house. They all come and spend some time in the house. We have some dogs that are basically, because they're older, they become house dogs. We also have, over the years, over the 40 years, I've had dogs. I think I've only placed two dogs over those years. In other words, basically, once a dog comes to our kennel, they're there for life. We have a blind dog. We have a dog, not only is he blind, he doesn't have any eyes, because we had to remove both of his eyes because of pressure in the eyes. And he'll always retire now. He was a great sled dog, even though he couldn't see. So yes, we sp I spend a lot of time because you're, you go out in the morning, and you have to clean up around them, clean up all the poop. We have an exercise pen. It's about 300 feet around. We put dogs down there. We feed twice a day. We're constantly just around them all the time. And sometimes, you know, in, when I was younger, I used to do a lot of stuff also with them in the summertime. I used to put packs on them and take them on hikes. And I used to ski drawer with them, and they'd pull firewood and pull wagons and parades and stuff. So there are a lot of different things. And the more things you do with them, the better you get to know them, the closer the bond that you form with them, the better they're going to be on the trail. How many dogs do you have right now? We have 12. Yeah. I've never had the, the, the biggest number of dogs I've ever had over the years was 19 or 20 which from a dog sledding perspective is a really tiny kennel. To for, give you an idea, to have a competitive Iditarod kennel, you're going to need, you know, depending on who you talk to, 35 to 100 dogs in your kennel. Okay? Because you're always constantly bringing in new dogs and they're having, you know, the Norwegians have figured out a way to be very competitive in some of these long distance races with much, much smaller kennels than the Alaskans or Canadians do. So, um, but, you know, I, I, in fact, the dogs that we have right now, all of them came to us, with one exception, all of them came to us from people who were either selling them or giving them away because for one reason or another they didn't want them anymore. Not, not that, of course, they were bad dogs, but for, for one reason or another. And we kind of really like the fact that we were able to do some of the things that we've been able to do with them, even though they're, they're sort of cast-offs, you might say. I'm a firm believer in the fact that there's too many dogs to begin with, too many good dogs, not just, obviously, other dogs, not just sled dogs, but particularly sled dogs. There's plenty of good sled dogs out there. And so, the only way I personally, my own philosophy is that, that you should do a breeding if, is if you're going to get something that you really want out of the breeding or something better than you have because there's, 